Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 5G teleconference. I'm Doug Wood, the Associate Director of Grassroots Environmental Education. And on behalf of everyone working to bring you this call tonight, welcome. We're coming to you from the completely hardwired offices of Grassroots. We're safely outside New York City on the North Shore of Long Island. And we welcome people from all over the world to this call. I'd like to explain a little bit about how this call happened. Originally, this call was going to be uh, about 10 or 15 people. Um, but this is a really critical issue to a lot of people and a very serious issue. And so we're glad to have everybody on the phone tonight. Why are we having this call? We want to build a community of like-minded people. We want to build a grassroots movement that can help educate the public and lawmakers about the science regarding wireless radiation. Now, they say that, you know, if the people lead, the leaders will follow, and that's our intent, is to help the leaders understand the science. There's a lot of ignorance out there among lawmakers and the public as well. Uh, the industry has done a pretty good job of keeping a lid on the science um, and, and telling lawmakers that there's just there's no science to support the idea that wireless radiation is harmful anyway. Um, Speaking of science, I want to acknowledge right here at the beginning that, you know, we stand on the shoulders of some of the giants in this field that have been working on wireless radiation for many years. The late Martin Blank, of course, from Columbia, uh, Ola Johansson, Leonard Hardell, Deborah Davis, Joel Moskowitz, Hugh Taylor, Martin Paul, and many others. Uh, I'm not going to be able to name everybody. But many of these people have risked their careers, literally, to get us to this point. They've worked uh, as hard as they can to give us the science, and now we've got the science, and it's up to us to kind of pick up the ball and move forward. We have a lot of really smart people on the line tonight. Some of them you're going to hear. Others you will get to know in subsequent phone events, and there will be other events a little better organized than tonight. Uh, with simple dial instructions and enough room for everybody. So I'm going to apologize for that uh, in advance. Um, but we are at a moment in time, a critical, critical time in Washington. And as you will hear later on during this call, there's some very troubling legislation that is working its way through Congress. And this is a time for us to work together. We're hoping that everyone can let bygones be bygones. We don't have time for you know, big egos or professional jealousy. Everybody has a role and something to contribute, and we need everybody on this effort, not just some people. So today we start with a clean slate. We move forward together, and I promise you we are not going to rest until we win. Speaking of winning, um, bad pun, but we have set up the win19.org website, which is a portal for new people coming to the issue for the first time. You might want to take a look at it. It's win19.org, WIN standing for the Wireless Information Network. Uh, we've also set up a list serve, and I've put that out on a couple of the messages, and I hope you um, will sign on. We're hoping that the list serve will become a kind of a conversation place for everybody after day on what's happening. Um, and I also mentioned in the email that uh, we have kind of reconfigured telecompowergrab.org. Uh, that was originally set up as, six, as SB 649 was making its way through California. I don't think we quite got it set up in time, although we did do that little movie. And then, uh, then the same thing happened in New York that happened in California. And to fight that, we put up uh, Telecom Power Grab, and we won. And they won in California. So I figured, hey, you know what? We're on a roll here. Let's see if we can't win in Washington. So we've reconfigured Telecom Power Grab now to be a Washington-focused item. Um, I want to mention before we go any further that we are not alone. We expect that we have um, some people on the phone who may not share our agenda. So um, I just put that caution out there. Um, this is a contentious issue, um, and uh, and certainly the industry. Um, you know, has its role to play, and, and ultimately, you know, we hope we can work with them and not against them. Um, that is our goal. We think everybody is for, you know, healthy. These people have families, too. And so, um, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping that we can find a, a common ground with them eventually, probably not right at first. 
I wish we had a small enough group to allow for questions and answers, but for tonight, I'm going to ask your patience and your indulgence. Let us present the program we've designed to get everybody up to speed on where we are and try to all get on the same page. We're going to have another call in a few weeks, and in the meantime, please be in touch with us on the win list or directly by email. So before I go any further, I'm going to introduce the, uh, some of the people who helped us put, e put this evening together. Um, Cindy Franklin of the Consumer for Safe Phones, Theodora Scarato from, is the Executive Director of the Environmental Health Trust, Ellie Marks from the California Brain Tumor Association, and Patty Wood, the Executive Director of Grassroots. And I'm going to each let them say a little bit now. Um, and I'm going to ask Cindy, would you give us a few words first? I'm Cindy. Hi, everybody. It's exciting that some of the people are on, on here tonight. Um, I've worked about 10 years on the issue of the health impacts of wireless radiation, uh, mostly related to cell phones and consumer devices. Um, last year, I got lured into being on the leadership team of the California Alliance for Safer Tech to fight uh, California small cell bill. We kind of get it, got in there on the 11th hour. Uh, for those, well, uh, as Doug said, Governor Brown did eventually veto the bill. And so we do feel that our, our effort contributed to that. Uh, so we call it a big success, too. Um, after the campaign, uh, we all realized in the other streets across the, the country that while, while we activists were engaged fighting against, you know, each state and in our neighborhoods, you know, the onslaught of these small cell bills at the local level, the industry was very successfully spending lots of money and effort lobbying Congress, who were in the process of pushing through the same small cell bills at the federal level to pave the way for 5G. You're going to get an update, as Doug said, on those. Um, so it's clear we do need a united um, effort. We can't just each go about our little in our little silos and expect to, uh, you know, get get much uh, accomplished uh, with what's going on in D.C. We need to get hundreds of thousands or hopefully millions if we do our do great outreach of, of citizens emailing, calling their federal elected officials to protest what's going on and hopefully offer what want um, instead, which um, we'll all be talking about in the future to move forward. Um, we can do this. We can build on what we learned from the California campaign, the New York campaign, the other campaigns. We've made mistakes, but we've learned from them. So thank you all for your passion and determination, and we all do have a recent Theodora Scarato, can I call on you next? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm Theodora Scarato, Executive Director of Environmental Health Trust. And we are a scientific think tank um, founded by Dr. Davis and Dr. Herberman. We publish research and raise awareness and brief policymakers on the science and policy issues. And I fully believe that we can be successful on this issue working together. I want to let you know about some of the resources that we've developed and are actually in the process of updating because so much is happening right now. We have a fact sheet on 5G that is hyperlinked to scientific studies on radio frequency radiation as well as the millimeter frequencies which are going to be used in 5G and to key facts, myths, sort of addressing some of the myths, um, as well as published documentation on how property values decrease. This is a great resource to send to policymakers and community leaders and actually probably by the end of this week we'll have the updated one with Dr. Cindy Russell's research as well as linking to, and you can also find this right on our website, ehtrust.org. We have a YouTube playlist all about 5G, and the first video has excerpts from various scientific conferences um, on 5G and health and radio frequency and health. So I thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing updates from everyone. Again, that's ehtrust.org. And I'll also be posting them on the WIN listserv as well. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Theodore. Great work you're doing in environmental health, Jeff, I must say. Um, 
Ellie Marks from the California Brain Tumor Association. Are you with us? I know you have to leave. I right. am here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, I want to thank Doug and Patty for taking the lead on this challenging endeavor, and I also want to thank all of the all of you who have called in tonight. Um, I'm the founder and director of the California Brain Tumor Association, and we focus on the prevention of primary brain tumors. We demand safe technology, and 5G is not safe. Last year, I chaired the California Alliance for Safer Technology, a group of concerned citizens and professionals, in an effort to stop California's SB 649, which would have stripped local authority in regard to small cell deployment. We educated citizens and legislators on the science, and I believe that our work played a part in some California legislators actually changing their votes and Governor Brown vetoing the bill at the last moment. We also raised funds to hire a professional lobbyist, and EWG joined our group and lobbied against SB 649 also. You can find some of our resources that we used at www.ca, the number four, safertech.com. Uh, despite this victory, telecom did ambush some of the wealthiest communities shortly thereafter with 4G to convert later to 5G. And they threatened California cities with lawsuits if they didn't allow them to install these small cells in the public right away. Um, city council members, city attorneys, and residents are caught up in this turmoil not knowing what they can and cannot do. And then I started getting calls and emails from people across the nation facing the same situation. People are desperate for answers as they try fighting this in their own communities. Um, Joel Moskowitz did set up a Google group, which has been helpful. However, we need more, as many remain fighting this alone, and we all need to come together now to challenge this at the national level, level where there are many 5G bills in play and a move to deploy 5G as soon as possible across America. We need representatives from every state, hopefully we have a lot of you on the phone tonight, to join our new group and educate your senators and congresspersons along with your neighbors who may not be in the know. Please take a moment to join the WIN19 listserv at www.win19.org if you have not already done so, and encourage your neighbors and even your local legislators to do so. It takes a village, but in regard to 5G, it'll take many villages working together to stop this horrific public health threat. But together, I think we really can beat this. So I thank you, and I look forward to working with many of you and taking back our nation from the stranglehold that Telecom has on our legislators. Thank you, thank Ellen. You. Thanks for your great work. Um, it's just terrific. Uh, well, Patty thank Wood, you. are you on the line? Yes. Great. Um, so hi, I'll, I'll make this very brief. It's um, it's really terrific to to uh, see so many people engaged here. But um, everyone on this call knows that the 5G legislation, if passed, is going to be hard to undo. The industry will spend about 56 billion to develop, test, and deploy these 5G services in the U.S. And that's through 2025, their prediction. So the purpose of this call is to really get to know each other, find out what strategies people have developed or already rolled out on 5G and local control. And we absolutely feel that a coordinated strategy is essential and that our individual efforts will be strengthened by working together um, in this effort to engage and activate many, many more concerned people to reach out to the lawmakers at FCC and the FDA, which was already mentioned. Um, but numbers really do matter. So, and also what was mentioned is that, that science has to be the driver and we have to constantly point to the thousands of independent peer-reviewed studies that show biological harm. Um, just at grassroots, um, we've produced a two-volume digest on the independent science on public health concerns regarding wireless radiation and have used these impressive volumes to win many local fights against 4G and 5G cell installations. So just to mention, I know that you've heard about California, but in New York, um, they didn't um, put this into the legislature. The law actually wound up in the governor's budget, um, but many stakeholders, including and especially the New York Conference of Mayors, helped us to have this removed from not only the governor's, but also the assembly and the Senate budgets for uh, this past spring. So. Um, we did win in New York, as they won in California, a little bit differently, but we were able to hold them back, um, uh, you know, in, in this state. So I don't know how much power that they have in D.C., but the, the United States Conference of Mayors really is an ally for us in this fight. 
And a final point is that many of us have been trying to bring an awareness to the public about the risks of this technology with programs like our Baby Safe Project, where we're trying to educate pregnant women about reducing the risk of using wireless devices or not using them at all. If you're not familiar with that, um, the website is um, babysafeproject.org. And it's, um, it is really, uh, you know, getting to the point where we have almost 300 uh, signatories on a joint statement from medical doctors and researchers from around the world, um, just basically, um, you know, confirming that pregnant women are especially vulnerable to this. Um, so we really need these, this choice as to whether we want to be exposed um, to this 24-7 so that this industry can provide just some of their customers with the ability to stream movies and games at hyperspeed all day long. And um, it's, it's, it's really quite outrageous. And it's, uh, I think, the thing that motivates all of us. And I'm hoping that, you know, this call and future calls and, and action um, pretty soon is going to, uh, is going to move us um, into a much better place than we are right now. Uh -huh. Thank you, Patty. As Patty said to me this afternoon, it's not fair that a single industry is going to impose on the entire population a technology which we know can be harmful for human health. Well put. Okay. Um, we're going to have some organizational reports now. Um, I'd like to turn to representatives of some of the groups that are working on this issue, and I emphasize some, not all. I know there are a lot of groups. You're going to have to be patient with us, and eventually we will hear from everyone over the course of the next few weeks. Um, but we've got about eight or nine groups we'd like to hear from tonight. We've given them three minutes each. Uh, Cindy is my timekeeper, and if you go over your time, you're going to hear a little chime, and that means you're done. I hate to do that, but the only way we can keep this organized is to uh, to be jealous of our time and respectful of everybody else's time. So, uh, Cindy Russell, let me turn to you, Physicians from Safer Technology. Are you on the line with us? Um, yes, I'm with you. Thanks so much. Great. Wonderful, wonderful organization, all the things that you've done. Um, very impressive. Really happy to be here. Um, I'm Cindy Russell. I'm a physician. I'm with uh, Physicians for Safe Technology. I'm a co-founder. Um, and that <clears throat> website is mdsafetech.org, or you can get to it by Physicians for Safe Technology. I started on this about eight or nine years ago when they wanted to put a cell tower in my daughter's school and uh, worked with uh, the California Medical Association to write a resolution to uh, ask, the, ask that um, the safety standards be reevaluated by the FCC. Um, I also uh, worked on a symposium in 2015 in Mountain View with Dr. Moskowitz was there um, speaking and with others um, and also then uh, worked on uh, developing uh, as a co-founder Physicians for Safe Technology. So we have on our our panel uh, Cindy Sage of Bioinitiative, uh, Joel Moskowitz, Dr. Scott Everly, uh, Roxana Marachi, she's San Jose State, hey, Victoria Dunsley, she's a physician, Dr. John West, uh, Dr. Phyllis, uh, and Dr. Lass. And our vision is to Come educate on. physicians and the public about the harm of, of EMF. Um, our uh, motto is our vision is a world where technology serves our needs without undermining our physical, psychosocial, or environmental health. So uh, uh, we're, we're doing this by providing science on our website as well. So we have a whole science section. It's divided into um, just different organs and, and NTP and so forth. We also have a review section and a policy section. So we have both the science and what we hope to do is take the information from other groups um, and put that on as well um, to spread the word about it. But we're, we're trying to be very mainstream um, and understanding that a lot of physicians are very uneducated about it. They just are very difficult. So I'm trying to work you know, locally. You are muted. I know for this as well. Um, and so when we look at strategies, um, we were to advocate for um, SB 649 to be vetoed. Um, um, we, we hope to do the same for the other bills and collaborate with people and perhaps collaborate on the 5G conference um, and also thinking of, of other avenues that we can, we can work uh, with with regards to lobbying Congress and so forth. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Cindy. Paul McGavin has this unbelievable thing that he's sitting in front of. I can see you, Paul, on the screen. Um, and I'm hoping that that you'll tell us more about that thing that you're sitting in front of and describe it for the people who are not on the video. 
Paul McGavin from Scientists for Wired Technology. Hi, right, thank you very much for the opportunity, and it's so great to have everybody together on the call together. Yes, I have sitting next to me a actual working model of the uh, small cell deployment, which we don't actually call small cells. We were successful in creating a new term along with Lena Poo. We call it a close proximity microwave radiation antenna dash wireless telecommunication facility. That's CPMRA dash WTF. Good to get the WTF on the end. <laughs> we actually see this term now showing up on actual official government websites, including the city of Sonoma. So someone from Sonoma created a real scale size mock-up of the equipment that goes onto the utility poles. And when you carry that into a room, people can see what it looks like. It is four feet tall, 15 inches in diameter, is just the antenna. And then we have the other pieces of equipment that uh, it actually totals about 35 cubic feet. So you can put this on a roller and walk straight up to a podium and show it to everybody in the room. This is what the community of Monterey did to win back in March. And though we have taken it one step further because we put all the cables on and made it very ugly, we had it on the street today at a Porch Fest event in Napa. We are fighting this on a bunch of cities in Northern California on a, street, a site called mystreetmychoice.com. And each city gets a chance to put up their own page with their specific next steps. And we've had some success. Uh, Verizon pulled all of the applications down in Monterey except for one, and then that one was denied. Hillsborough denied all 16, and now they're getting sued, but I believe they will win in court. Sebastopol actually got the Verizon to pull that application. There were two there in Sebastopol. Petaluma, before getting applications, last uh, Monday, on the 16th, passed ordinances to say no small cells in residential zones, only in commercial industrial zones, a 500-foot setback to any residence in any zone, and 1,500 feet between any small cell, meaning you can claim one pole, you've got to let four go by, then you go to the next pole, but you can't put anything in between. So if Verizon takes pole A and pole F, nobody gets B, C, D, and E at all. Very good idea. So Petaluma came up with their own strong ideas of how to protect the residential zones. So we also played a big role in uh, the, the veto of SB 649. In fact, I spoke to Governor Brown on October 14th, the day before he vetoed it. He came to Santa Rosa for the fire victims, and I was able to grab his hand and spoke to him for a full 10 minutes, wouldn't let go. And I told him all the reasons why the bill was terrible and a fire hazard, and why we needed undergrounded fiber optic and copper landlines in order to get the emergency alerts. When you and look at the fires in Santa Rosa, we have 60 dead and missing. Those that had wired copper landlines that have remote power still work in a power outage. They got warned and they got out with reverse 911 calls. Those that depended solely on wireless alerts never got the alerts. So that was a message he heard at that time and I put it into his hands all the people that filled out the form on my website, 675 of them, opposing SB 649, as well as everybody who signed the uh, California Safe Technology uh, petition. I believe that was another 120 pages of stuff. And I got it in his hand as he went out the door to his helicopter to fly back. So 24 hours later, he vetoed, and we were very, very happy. So we were good that everybody worked so hard on that. Well, I just want to say, you know, you're doing tremendous work, and I want you to really come back on another call and, and tell us more. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn to Kate Keel from What Is 5G. Kate, are you with us? Hi, thank you, Doc. I'm Kate Keel. I'm the creator of the website What Is 5G dot info. It was a web. It is a website intended as a resource for people who want to learn more about what 5G and the IoT are and people who want to take action to oppose these. The website presents one side only, the downsides, the costs of 5G and the IoT. On the website, I delineated nine different subject areas, not just health, um, so people can choose what to pitch to whichever audience they're speaking. Some, are, some people are more irked by health, some by privacy, uh, some by cybersecurity and some just by the sheer insanity of the whole thing. So the website provides you uh, information on all the different approaches. The nine topics delineated are health, environment, cybersecurity, 
privacy, effects on our brains and humanity, energy consumption, e-waste, conflict, minerals, and ethical issues. The website also includes a page on the benefits of fiber over wireless and urges for the vast majority of our internet and uh, technology communications be done over fiber, reserving wireless for only the essential applications that can only be accomplished through wireless. Um, most people still do not know what 5G and the IoT are. The advantage of our issue is unlike cell phones that actually do have some genuine appeal and use, people can stay in touch with family, kids, and so forth, with the IoT, the trade-off is uh, just not worth it. Um, the, what's being offered are um, connected clothing, connected diapers, connected pills, and it is uh, robots in our homes. Most people find this distasteful in and of itself. So when we explain that the cell towers are being put in for this, it's just not worth it. They, most people don't think it's worth it. Or the faster video downloading speeds that they're advertising. So it's a little easier than fighting on the cell phone issue um, because the IoT itself is so unappealing. Um, if we wake people up fast enough to say no thank you to 5G and the IoT, then the telecom's business model may just fail and they may have to turn their progress obsession to fiber and to things that actually do benefit us. Uh, I invite everybody to stay alert and ready to act on all petitions, phone calls. Go to the Take Action page on the 5G website and there are many, many actions you can take. Flyers you can hand out, uh, bumper stickers you can order, yard signs, um, and so forth. It's exciting times if we put our outrage into unified action. Was that the bell that I heard? Thank you. Yes, that was the Thank bell. You. Thank you. Okay. Do yeah. I need to ring it louder? <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. I just okay. I couldn't see what that phone was. Thank you, Kate, uh, so much for your work and for your excellent website. If people haven't been there, they should go. What is 5G.org? Um, got info. Got info. I'm sorry. Absolutely right. Um, Janine Deal, are you on the phone, my friend from Michigan? Hi, hi, this is Janine. I'm calling from Michigan. Um, I am by no means a 5G expert, um, so I'll only take a minute, but I was helping the national activist Kevin Modis when I discovered Michigan's 5G bills, and I knew I had to start a, a basically an email address for uh, notifying people, so that's how Michigan Safe Technology started. I'm Michigan Safe Technology at gmail.com, and uh, I also own the uh, the domain name Michigan Safe Technology.com. And if you enter that into a Google search, it will take you currently to our Facebook page. We are working on a website, but um, that's kind of slow going. Um, my vision, you talked about visions for the future, and um, probably like most everybody else, this massive awareness of wireless health effects, um, that would be my goal, massive awareness for wireless health effects. Vision would be massive mitigation, correction, retraction, repayment, reorganization, and elimination, and my values are health and safety. Um, as some of you may already know, also, we have a senator here, Patrick Colbeck, who is on our side. He, he is for analog meter choice, and he has spoken in the Senate in caucus and on the Senate floor against the 5G bills here in Michigan that did pass out of the Senate pretty easily, the Michigan Senate. And we lobbied hard to get them into the um, same committee where our analog meter choice bill is and it is there currently. We do have um, people working with their townships, their cities, uh, to get resolutions passed in opposition um, to the 5G small cell towers in the, their public right of way. Um, we did have uh, Daphna Takover from Where Are the Evidence come, and she did, uh, I think, like 22 public 
uh, presentations regarding wireless and health effects, and that helped um, dramatically to grow our numbers. We are thinking about also continuing that, um, just having other people, myself and uh, maybe others, give uh, public presentations. I think that's basically my big push is, is uh, to educate the public, and somebody had mentioned already that our strength is going to be in our numbers. I truly, truly believe that. I believe that we just have to continue educating people because if nothing else, they will know uh, why they're getting sick. So um, I think that's, uh, that's all I have to share. Thank you, and I'm so honored to be uh, among this group of wonderful people. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Janine Deal from Michigan Safe Technology. Uh, we're very happy to have on the phone Mr. Jim Turner, uh, representing Manhattan Neighbors for Safe Technology and also the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy. Jim Turner, are you on the phone? Hi, good to be here. I really uh, appreciate very much hearing all of the uh, activities that are underway, and I think uh, a lot of progress is being made. Um, I have a very simple statement to make today. We at uh, uh, National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy have been putting out a series of papers on uh, various EMF issues. Uh, they're all available. Uh, you can you can get them from that site or uh, Citizens for Health or um, any other number of others. Uh, you can just come directly to me, uh, Jim, uh, Jim at swankin-turner.com. But uh, the main thing I wanted to talk about was a new uh, initiative that a number of us are putting together, which is called the American Health Coalition. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a um, platform that's designed to um, accumulate all, all the various items that we work on where health choice is a major issue. The premise is that uh, there are a wide number of people working on all kinds of issues that have health choice as a common idea, uh, and we want to promote all of those people uh, in a way that everyone can find everyone else. The premise is that on this issue, with the 5G issue, uh, there are many people who don't know anything about 5G but are very, very interested in health choice and health freedom, their rights and so forth. And if they were to know about this subject, they would, in fact, I think, uh, uh, participate in some way in the issue. So the premise of uh, American Health Coalition, which is uh, uh, starting up with a, a number of um, um, some very media savvy uh, social media folks, uh, the idea is to gather messages. We don't have any content that we create. Uh, what we do is uh, promote other people's content across various platforms. So uh, look for um, Americans for uh, American Health Coalition, American Health Coalition. Then you'll find a number of issues, and this one is there. Uh, what we um, intend to do is to make sure that everyone working on other issues where they're looking for um, health choice will know about this issue. So uh, that's um, all I have to say. I really appreciate being here, and I'm glad to be working with a group of people like the ones I've been listening to. Great, Jim. Thank you so much. And, and Jim, I should mention, Jim works closely with our friend Camilla Reese. Many of you on the phone may know Camilla and her outstanding work that she's also doing. So uh, thank you to both of you guys. Um, Catherine Kleber, I'm going to mispronounce her last name, I think. Is it Kleber or Kleber from Electrical, Electrical Pollution? Are you on the phone with us? Hi, it's it's Catherine Kleiber. Kleiber, okay, good. Thanks. Uh, I have a website, electricalpollution.com. I've been working on this issue for about 17 years now. I started out working on electrical pollution, um, dirty electricity, which is hence the name of my website. Um, so I work on a range of um, RF-related issues, I guess, um, and I have been pulling together a lot of information in late, of late, um, particularly related to one of the side effects of um, the saturating the atmosphere with radio frequency radiation. And I have a page up on that um, called RFI detection. Um, and basically what it, I have found, and um, this is, I found it in a um, ham radio operator's handbook, is that when you have metal to metal junctions, and you put a lot of RF across it, it becomes an RF transmitter. So in, in the developed countries, that means basically a lot of essential stuff in, in most people's homes and becomes an RF transmitter at other frequencies. 
Um, and this is very important because it seems to be very biologically active and it is a side effect that um, this 5G will undoubtedly exacerbate. Um, and so you might want to just check that out. Um, in addition to that, I have focused a lot on steps that people can take um, because I have radio frequency sickness, steps that people can take to um, mitigate their own personal living environment um, to help them be healthier and um, fight this fight better. Um, and that's on the solutions page. So that's kind of what I've been up to. I'm now also um, started working with um, Elaine Unger, and I'm very grateful that she's um, started a group with, uh, along with some other people, Wisconsin for Safe Technology, and they're working on getting up and running. Um, I'm also working right now on um, getting together a, a petition, and I realize this is only one very small part of what needs to be done um, to, to um, help people let our elected officials know about our opposition to 5G and um, why we oppose 5G. And um, I've been working with Elaine to try and um, get awareness out um, in the public. One of the things we're hoping to be working on is getting um, yard signs out, and I hope that um, other groups will start to do that. I know <laughs> I was listening to Paul the Gavin discussions about some of their awareness raising stuff with, with great um, I guess, uh, admiration. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, if we people who aren't quite up to that level, if we can start getting yard signs out, one of the ways to get this in the media is to have a great visible yard sign, T-shirt, um, you know, everything in between. Um, that that you know, it's it's right out there with websites on the yard sign, so that everybody who walks by, you know, might well look it up. Great, so. Catherine, thank you so much, and good luck with your work out there. Um, yes. I think yard signs are a great idea. We put them up for our farmer's market and we got flooded this year with new people, so they do work. Um, Theodore uh, Scarato, are you on the phone and did you want to talk just a little bit more about uh, the Environmental Health Trust materials that you've got? Um, so I wanted to bring out a few important things that we'll be having on our fact sheet that I hope everyone is aware of, and that's that the cell phone company documents clearly state that 5G will increase the levels of radio frequency radiation in the vicinity of the antennas. Um, and I think um, Arthur will be talking about this next, but the antennas could have a thousand simul simultaneously transmitting antennas called phased arrays. And the higher millimeter waves to be used in 5G are the same frequencies used by the military and crowd control weapons as it makes the skin feel like it's on fire. Now, because it's going to be increasing the RF radiation, many countries, such as China, India, Poland, Russia, Italy, and Switzerland, which have far stricter radiation limits in terms of the public exposures, the amount um, ambient in the air from, from cell tower networks, this is not going to allow the deployment of 5G as industry would like, and their documents state that because the increased radiation will exceed the lower limits of these countries. And I'll be actually, what I'll do is I'll put this on the Facebook feed and, and elsewhere so you can see some of their PowerPoints on this. So they are launching large scale efforts to change these limits. Despite that, uh, the Swiss Parliament just rejected a proposal to relax these rules despite a large scale PR effort. Um, we have a database on international policy. I hope everyone is aware of it has what's happening in different countries, the recommendations by health ministries. We also have a dedicated web page to the California firefighters who were able to get an exemption from these installations on their fire stations, and it has videos of their testimony, published research on impacts to the birds and bees, and I'm going to pass this now on to Ed Myers for my last one minute about the filing he's done to the FCC in regards to their federal action. Ed, are you on the phone? Yes, I'm here. Yes, uh, I'm Ed Myers. I'm an attorney in Washington, uh, but I got involved in this because they want to put a small, so-called small cell tower directly across the street from my house. And I intervened in the pending uh, appeal of the FCC's uh, March order dispensing with NEPA review and also National Historic Preservation Act review of uh, deployments of these small cell towers. 
which is highly offensive to me as a lawyer, let alone uh, problematic for me as a, as a resident of this community. There, I, uh, Theodore asked me to just briefly set out the status of the appeals. Uh, we're very hopeful that the FCC's decision can be overturned. There are five petitions for review pending in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Four of them were filed by uh, groups of various groups of Indian tribes or Native American tribes. The fifth was filed by the National Resources Defense Council. Uh, the FCC has moved to hold all of these appeals in abeyance, which is basically put, put the cases on hold because there are still a few uh, petitions for reconsideration pending before the FCC. The FCC's theory is that the court, the court should not hear the appeals since the agency, the FCC, hasn't finished reviewing all the petitions for reconsideration. So that's pending before the court. We don't really know how that's going to turn out. Uh, there have been oppositions filed to the FCC's motion, uh, and we're just going to wait and see what happens there. At the same time, uh, some of the Indian tribes have filed emergency motions to put the FC to stay the FCC's order, which would put the FCC's order on hold. And those motions are also pending uh, court decision. Yeah, I'm going to have to interrupt you and just say that we're going to, we're going to come back at another time and, and have a legal call so we can find out about all the legal cases that are running. Um, oh, sure. we got a, a, a slew of other people, but thank you so much, Ed, for that. Not a problem. My um, pleasure. And Arthur Furstenberg, are you on the phone with us? And Arthur from the Cellular Phone Task Force and author of this great book that I've got sitting in my living room. Are you on, Arthur? Hi. Yes. Um, I've been working on this issue for 37 years wow. and um, I was a co-founder of Cellular Phone Task Force in 1996, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. We do education, advocacy, and support around this issue. I uh, helped um, defeat SB 649 in California. My organization was a channel for the funding that paid for radio ads all across uh, California. Um, what I'm working on right now, the most important things that I'm working on right now, is we are about to file a legal action in Santa Fe, um, naming city, state, and United States as defendants asking for declaratory relief that 5G laws and Section 704 are unconstitutional. Um, I am also working on an international appeal um, of scientists, doctors, and environmental organizations that have been doing basically nothing else for the past two months, and we expect to launch it within about a week. Um, we have put together a comprehensive, fully referenced document, um, and uh, that's a basic summary of what we're doing. It's uh, I'm working on it on a local, state, national, and international level. Arthur, tell us a little about your book. My book, um, The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life, is the most comprehensive book ever written on the environmental and health aspects of electromagnetic energy, and the history of same, the physics of same, and the politics of same. Um, starting from 1746 and going till today, it has chapters on cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, it, it, it unites all the knowledge from astronomy and physics and uh, Chinese medicine and a lot of fields that no one has put together before. Well, thank you for, for writing it. Uh, as I said, it's sitting in our living room, and I've been dipping into it. It's absolutely fascinating, so thank you for that. Um, let me call on Eric Wind uh, Windheim from the EMF Safety Network. Um, Eric, are you on? Yes, I'm here. My name Eric. is Eric Windheim. I'm a building biologist and electromagnetic radiation specialist. And uh, the EMF Safety Network was very, very helpful to me uh, back in 2012. It's really quite a great support organization. Um, 
I had to battle my utility about smart meters. They wanted to put one on the wall, and it was just me going to the utility meetings, and then people came out of the woodwork from this organization, like Antoinette Stein, PhD, Nina Beattie, and others, and gave me the tools and information I needed to go there and point out the lies that they were putting in print. So, and the EMS safety network has really started off with smart meters. But recently, uh, they have written a letter to the um, city of Sebastopol. Uh, they spent uh, to, uh, about uh, stopping the 5G. Uh, they've got easy click emails where you just fill in your name and you send them to your congressman. That's quite a good tool, kind of like you know all the advocate groups that um, want you to donate money. They just say click here and mail to your congressman. It was founded and headed, and is still headed up by Sandy Maurer, who's a mother in Sebastopol. And they spent considerable money with Best Best and Krieger uh, on advice for how to, California cities can oppose small cell towers. And they've got a, a legal statement on their website about that. Um, what I do personally is to take measurements, write reports, even expert witness uh, letters, um, to help people avoid uh, cell towers um, if they're a tenant um, and they need to break a lease because the cell tower is too close, I help them do that by documentation. Um, if it's a, a large housing project that is getting a second dosage of cell antennas and they need protection because people are already getting sick, uh, I take measurements and we provide roofing uh, shielding solutions. So I'm more solution oriented now. Uh, the, the, the EMS safety network really helped me mature into what I am because if it wasn't for them, I don't think I would have ever made it. And uh, you can find them easily on the website, on the web. They're called emfsafetynetwork.org. And my personal Wait. website is Windheim EMF Solutions. Dot com. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to cut you off because we are running sure. late and I've got sure. to run through this. I've got a slew of people, including a couple of people who've been uh, emailing and and, uh, and we're going to try to get them on. Right now we're going to turn to, kind of to a legislative report. I want to give you a, a snapshot of kind of where we are with the current legislation. Um, I'm sure there are people on the phone who may know more about this and may have later information, but um, I think my information is pretty good, so let me go through this very quickly. Uh, the big piece of legislation that's out there in the Senate right now is the streamlining. I love this. These guys must spend their time, all their time thinking up titles. Here's the title. Streamlining the rapid evolution and modernization of leading edge infrastructure necessary to enhance small cell deployment act which is also known as the Streamline Small Cell Deployment Act. Under a section called preserving local, uh, the preservation of local zoning authority, um, they proceed to take away local zoning authority with a particularly uh, a troublesome sentence which says that a uh, no state or local government uh, shall prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless service. Um, that could be interpreted in many troubling ways, including basically saying you can't say no to small cells. As if to anticipate the environmental issues and the health issues that may come along, they specifically wrote into the Streamline Act um, uh, that no state or local government may regulate the placement construction so on, on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that facilities comply with the commission's regulations concerning such emissions. And that is basically the same wording that's in the 1996 uh, Telecommunications Act, but they put in here just to make sure we heard it. Um, a local state or local government can only deny a permit based on publicly available criteria that are, quote, reasonable, objective, and non-discriminatory. Uh, the Streamline Act includes a 60-day shot clock for a local government to decide, and if there is no decision, the permit is deemed to be approved. Um, you, no state or local government can have a moratorium on construction for any reason, and the fees that can be charged for putting up these cell uh, 
uh, small cell facilities on uh, utility poles in public right-of-ways is limited to the actual direct cost only, such as how much does it cost to keep the lights on during the meeting. Um, there is no revenue to municipalities from the private use of public rights of ways by telecom industry. This is completely outrageous that we have private industry using public property to make money for themselves and in the meantime exposing us all. So the Streamline Act is the big one in the Senate uh, that we are uh, kind of looking at and, and strategizing around. There's another act called the Airwaves Act. That's uh, House Resolution 4953. It's called the Advancing Innovation and Reinvigorating Widespread Access to Viable Electromagnetic Spectrum. Basically, this is an auction of uh, additional spectrum. There's been a lot of complaints by the telecom industries that they, they want to have this spectrum uh, available to them for 5G. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're building it out and they're getting government to give them the bandwidth for 5G as if it's a foregone conclusion that they're going to go ahead. There's a lot of talk uh, around the Airways Act about how the U.S. is currently behind China and South Korea in the race for 5G deployment, and uh, we have to do everything we can to, uh, to stay up with them. Uh, there's a piece of legislation that Ellie mentioned to me, which I had to laugh at. I thought she was kidding at first. It's called the Self-Drive Act. Uh, and that stands for the Safely Ensuring Lives Future Deployment and Research in Vehicle Evolution Act. This preempts all state regulation of self-driving cars. And I love this sentence, which I found in the middle of it, quote, the secretary may not condition deployment or testing of highly automated vehicles on a review of safety assessment certifications. I found that to be an interesting comment, that you can't base your uh, your deployment on whether they're safe or not. Uh, there's one more bill that's running its way through Congress, and that is the American Vision for Safer Transportation Through Advancement of Revolutionary Technologies Act, or otherwise known as the AV Start Act. This is a little bit like the Self Drive Act. Uh, this is the Senate version of the Self Drive Act. Unfortunately, because self driving cars keep crashing. Um, legislators have kind of shied away, and both of these things are currently stalled in Congress, not going uh, much of anywhere at the moment. The Streamline Act, I might add, is racing ahead, but these other these others are um, are kind of holding. I want to mention just quickly uh, the assault on NEPA. As as many of you know, the NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act, which is a law that empowers local communities to protect themselves and their environment from any sort of dangerous or rushed or poorly planned federal projects. Um, if you want to build a new cell tower, if you want to co-locate an antenna on an existing structure, that requires compliance with NEPA. But uh, the telecom, telecom industry is slowly chipping away at that. In March, the FCC approved an order to accelerate the national approval process for deploying 5G small cells by loosening the regulations on their deployment in the U.S. Previously, NEPA uh, and the National Historic Preservation Act were required to review small cell installations, and under the new, uh, new order, the majority of small cells will be exempt from NEPA and NHPA reviews, but the larger towers will still have to be um, approved through NEPA. So that's kind of a quick overview of the current national legislation. Um, I'd like to turn to Daphne Tackover. Daphne, if you're on the phone, I know that you were in the, at the hearing the other day. I wanted if you want to give us a, just a, a minute or so and give us a flavor of what happened in Washington. Um, thank you, Doug. Well, we started our efforts in, um, in uh, July 14, 2016, when FCC announced the fast tracking of 5G and everything has been working nonstop. Our organization has been working nonstop on every level, on the federal level, on the state level, and on the municipality level. Um, we spent, actually we were doing most of the lobbying on this issue, and we spent many, many months in D.C. Uh, lobbying. However, it seems that those lobbying efforts, to me, they seem to be quite ineffective because first we don't have the checkbook, and then we also, there was not enough grassroots movement to support and help us get meetings with the actual congressman. And um, as a result, I tried to constantly find other more effective ways to attack this issue. 
And um, we've been working on a project, on a project. Uh, he said that there are maybe uh, not so good people on this line, so I would not elaborate on that. We're still working on a little uh, 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 project that hopefully will materialize on that soon. Um, in the meanwhile, I, I, I kind of like uh, diverted my efforts to the state level because I think that's where people have more power. Um, I've been touring the country, giving lectures in the past few months. I gave dozens and dozens of lectures. We supported the efforts of many uh, activists in states like California, Ohio, Maryland, Michigan, uh, New Jersey, Oregon, et cetera, et cetera. And we found those efforts to awaken communities are pretty effective, as, um, as Janine mentioned before. Uh, we had hundreds uh, more activists in each of the states trying to work on this issue. So that was very uh, gratifying. However, uh, what we learned is that, you know, when we give those lectures, people want instructions as to what to do. And unfortunately, we don't have the winning strategy, and that's why I continue to try and find ways to make our efforts more effective and, and know what to tell to those people. Um, one way which I found my efforts, uh, important efforts, uh, one, one thing I decided to put my efforts on was trying to help uh, Senator State Senator Colbeck in Michigan get elected because he's going to, he's committed to the wireless issue. Um, and hopefully, if we'll have one governor in a state that is supportive on our issue, that will create a breakthrough. So that is a worthwhile effort. Um, the other thing is, I think that um, um, one thing that I did find effective in all our efforts is to put the effort on the, and the uh, focus on the human evidence, not just on the science. Because uh, when I spent time in Congress and on the state, um, many of those we spoke to and met with actually uh, have symptoms. So once you make them realize that the symptoms they or, the, or their family members are having are caused by water, so much more uh, inclined to listen and help. And there is an epidemic from what It's already happening. It's already there. You just have to make people realize that's what's causing their symptoms. So whether it's our legislators or uh, people who just attend those meetings and want to know what to find and understand those things is very helpful. Um, I think in terms of strategies, um, I think that, um, um, you know, the um, SB3715 is really important in terms of um, it, it's crucial that we stop this silent space. And probably what people need to know is that to stop legislation in Senate, you need this one senator to put a halt on the bill. And that's I think right. that that's where our efforts should be. Thank you so much. We're going to have a, 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 another call coming up exclusively on the legislation. And I'm going to let you speak a little bit more. Right now, I've got to move on. Deborah Copold, are you on the phone? Uh, I want to just give you a, a couple of minutes. Deborah was key to us stopping this thing in Washington, in, uh, in New York, and has been super helpful to grassroots in terms of uh, dealing with this legislation. Deborah, are you on? Thank you. This has been a really good conference call. and. Uh, Good to hear what everybody's doing. I think I just wanted to say a few things about sort of the legal and policy end of things. Um, one of the reasons, at least in New York State, really the companies who are getting really aggressive is a few of us and some lawyers have figured out that effectively, if you had your planning and zoning board notate that there was no need uh, for um, 5G because you had no hole in coverage, right? Because if there was no hole in coverage, as in phone coverage, there was no legal need for faster broadband or 5G. And they knew that some of us had figured this out, and eventually more people would figure it out, which is why they wanted to try to get this foothold to force it up. So again, and I haven't looked at every state, but at least in New York, if you're planning and zoning board documents that there's no, you know, significant hole in coverage that this thing is going to cover, or the 5G will cover, you can really defeat it on that basis if you get there early and often. And um, I was actually on, on the other line while Doug was introducing, but I'm sure he explained that what we did together in New York, uh, Governor Cuomo had wanted to gut all of the local planning and zoning. Um, what this bill does, the only thing I would just add to what Doug said is the phrase that Doug quoted was actually in the original Section 7. I think the thing that concerns me, because I kept reading it, was uh, 7C, Placement, Construction, and Modification, where they talk about having a standard. They say that the state has to have publicly available criteria and reasonable, objective, and non-discriminatory standards. Now, 
what I fear is going forward, a court will then say, well, it's not reasonable to have something in your ordinance that says that the 5G transmitter has to be 1,500 feet from a house because some towns have that in their ordinance or it has to be in a business zone, not a residential zone. So one of the things that we really should be concerned about killing is that Section C um, and this bushy language about being reasonable on whatever the, the town's citing criteria for the 5G is. So this is how they're trying to get the foothold there. I think a lot of what this bill does, which the municipal organizations are not happy with, is what Doug was saying before, which was that the fees were going to be, you know, um, capped effectively. So they're concerned about the economics of that. Um, so I think where we were successful in New York was we kind of did two-pronged approach. We sort of recognized that the message that was resonating was uh, sort of a don't tread on me, local government is sacrosanct. We happen to have home rule in New York, which helps, but this is a message I think will resonate in Congress. There's so little control as there is yeah. just to control any of these powers, but it, what we have is to be controlled by local government. So we should. Deborah, gonna, you're going to have to come back and join us on our legislative call. That's great. I appreciate your insight. Can I say opinion. one thing? No, so one thing. thing is that if you're going to change uh, anything from Section 7, which is what this bill does, it should be about the health preemption and the environmental preemption, not creating more avenues to force this stuff up. So we have to combine the two messages, the environmental radiation problem with the do not take away uh, rights of local government. Yeah, great. Deborah, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, for those uh, for those who don't know, uh, this is 5G is not about cell phone coverage. 5G is not about broadband. 5G is not about uh, emergency service. 5G is about streaming video. 5G is about letting the uh, the um, telecoms compete with your cable company to stream video to you and your neighbors, and you're going to be exposed 24/7. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the lobbyist who works with Grassroots. He's the uh, legislative director for Citizens Campaign in Albany and also has been working in, um, in Washington. Bill Cook, can, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Listen, folks, uh, briefly, we have 100 days. This is about one thing, and that thing is that getting our federal elected officials to not do anything on this issue. We have 100 days and what we need to do is get literally everybody who's done something needs to do one more thing and those who haven't done anything need to do something. Here's what it is. Phone calls are the best. If you're going to send a letter to your elected officials to the district office, if you're going to do an email, fine. But right now with 100 days left, we're urging you to call your Congress member call your federal senator and ask them what they're going to do to stop this from happening. Don't do anything on 5G. We've got time. It's a home rule issue. There's lots of issues you can talk to them about. It's a health issue. It's a state's rights issue. There is no rush. This is a property grab. It doesn't matter what you're saying to them, but call them. And one of the most important things you can do on this issue is ask when you're on the phone with the staff person. Ask what the Congress member, the Senator is going to do, and you want them to contact you and tell you. You want a response. That triggers how they handle it. So whether you're talking about the fact that you, you want specific legislation stopped, whether you're talking to them about the fact that you don't want any legislation dealing with 5G till after the elections, we need to just get through the 100 days then we can start to think the longer term. But in the 100 days, the best thing we can do is take an action. The best action is a phone call, an email, a letter now. That's all I wanted to share. Thank you, Bill. Um, hey, Kevin, I am on the line. Oh, Kevin, great. Okay, you've got two minutes. Okay, hi, this is uh, Kevin Modis, and uh, I ran for U.S. Senate in California to try to bring attention to this issue. I am in Washington, D.C., working to educate legislators on this issue. 
People can reach me at 5G is harmful at gmail.com. 5G is harmful at gmail.com. Um, two things that I think are important. The um, 5G auction, um, my understanding is it's in November. Um, this is a really important thing to focus on trying to stop this auction because once they expend, once they sell, I think it's going to be $80 billion worth of spectrum and the companies are actually required to use it. It's, this is going to be very hard to stop. And then the Senate bill introduced by Senator Thune, and Senator Thune is from South Dakota. He's basically spearheading and shoving this stuff down our throats. Um, anyone um, who knows people in South Dakota, we need, uh, I need information regarding those people. We need help putting pressure on Senator Thune. Um, and um, it's uh, S3157, um, the bill we've been talking about, is, is particularly wicked. Now, there was 10 bills that were passed as part of the omnibus, and I haven't, I didn't circulate that. I will send that out uh, this week um, that, that were already passed in the omnibus, um, and people should be aware of, of, of what they did. And one of them was um, the, uh, the Raper Act. What was it? I'm getting confused. Anyway, it was, there was, the Mobile Now Act was passed uh, as another, in another form. Uh, which was a significant uh, loss for us. So um, I believe the place to focus is on the federal level because on the federal level, they're trying to preempt all the state and local measures. And so ultimately, this issue in particular is coming from the FCC and Congress themselves. Congress is definitely empowering the FCC. Congress can definitely stop the FCC, um, but they're definitely not. Uh, the recent hearing, they were basically just jamming the FCC, why you're not doing more, why you're not doing it faster. Um, and, um, you know, Congress is the problem. Congress is the solution. People need to go to their local offices and meet with their representatives, demand a meeting with their representatives, and start working on them. And don't just go to one of the local offices. Go to all of the local offices in your state. And if you can call and contact other, other uh, congressmen and senators, we need to start applying pressure. We start, need to start educating these legislators. It makes it easier when I go in and speak with office if they've been hearing from you guys in terms of phone calls and emails. It does help. Um, so we need to do it. If you can come to D.C. for a week and literally just be in the hall and the representatives are very easy to tell who they are, and just talk to them, shake their hands, say, listen, I'm electrosensitive, I get sick from this stuff. Um, you need to understand what you're doing is hurting us, you know. So we just need people here, we need people present, we just need to spend the time to educate and keep, keep making this something. They don't listen to the research. Um, what they hear is, oh, yeah, I heard a little bit about that. They hear a little bit on TV, they hear some things, they, people they talk to, and they kind of just put together some idea in their head, and that's what they go with. Well, having people here talking to them here and there and here and there kind of helps form that that idea in their head, and that's how they base their that's what they base their decisions on little bits and pieces, and that's what the lobbyists do. That's what we need to do also. Yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for all your work and for being with us tonight. Really appreciate that. Um, we're going to uh, wrap this up because it is getting late. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, my uh, my co-hosts here, Cindy, Franklin, Theodoro. I know Ellie had to go early. Patty Wood, uh, any final thoughts before I wrap it up? I, I think, you know, you've done a great job facilitating, Doug. Thank you so much for what you're doing, and thank you to everybody. The presentations have been so enlightening, and um, I, I'm really excited to get going on this. Thank you. Patty? I'm just I'm just impressed with the number of um, the number of people who have um, who have really you know worked on this issue for such a long time, you know 27 years and 30 years and it, this is a you know this is a big moment an opportunity for us we really need to do something here and I think that if we can stop like Bill said if we can just stop them from doing anything before the election I think that should be the focus at this point right now. And so maybe we have a call, you know, in, in less than two weeks so that we can, um, we can just kind of organize around that. And certainly we can be in touch with each other, you know, before we have another call, uh, and, and start, start working on that right away. Great. Theodore, did you have anything you want to add before I wrap it up? 
Um, no, but uh, if there is a briefing that you want to put on with your with your policymaker, or even a more informal kind of conversation we can have over Skype, please contact us at ehtrust.org, info at ehtrust.org to set that up. So, uh, I have just one other word. I mean, uh, how I don't know who's who's connected, but you know, having a congressional hearing, um, any yeah. kind of a an opportunity to have a hearing and have you know, some of the best representatives from um, from this group, the scientists, um, you know, from this group actually go to Washington and, mm -hmm. and speak directly um, to our legislators would be uh, really wonderful if we could make that happen, you know, within the next 100 days. Mm -hmm. We'll do our best. I want to thank everybody who's on the phone. We really do appreciate your time. I know, uh, you know, it's Sunday night, not the easiest time to get on the phone, but uh, I really do appreciate it. Over the next couple of weeks or, or sooner, um, we're going to be putting together a, you know, a strategy plan based on your feedback. So please get on the win list. Go to win19.org and click on the listserv and join up that way. Or you can send me a direct email or, or anybody else on this call um, to make sure that we're all connected. Uh, we are going to have a lobby day if we can get it organized quickly. Uh, we want to have some sample letters to the editor. We've got some radio spots that we want to run on local radio across the country. Uh, we want to develop some science-based articles for media. Um, but this is going to take all of us pushing in the same direction. And if we do, and we can make it happen for 100 days, all we have to do, as Bill Cook said, is to keep them from doing anything for 100 days. So there's no, no harm in trying, and we're going to do our best. In fact, I have a feeling that we're going to win this one. Again, thank you to everybody who was on the phone tonight. Uh, good night from New York.